Okay. We're in the right spot here. Do you do you need me to put my earbuds in? Yeah, that would be awesome. That'll probably make the uh, the audio on your end sound a little bit more clear. So. Perfect. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, it sounds great. Um, do you do you hear the the hum of a little my little electric heater here that's trying to warm me up? No, but you can okay. totally feel free to keep that guy on. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. But uh, so, did you get a chance to look at like the questions on the on the primer? I did. That I sent. Yep. Were there any that like jumped out at you? Um, I could tell the guy who wrote them is a creative. <laughs> so <laughs> I love them all. I mean, I, I th these are my favorite kind of interviews. Uh, so you, you you lead with whatever you want to lead with, and I'll I'll we'll just I'm sure it'll flow very easily and naturally. I'm you know I do this all the time, and and I I love these kind of uh, interviews. So you're you're tapping right into my creative juices with any of those questions. Okay, awesome. Um, usually the way that we do it is like we'll just uh kind of start talking and then we'll cut cut in wherever it feels like it uh, starts being useful that Takes way. Off. Yeah, sure. that way it's like, um, I just find, at least for myself, whenever there's like the beginning moment where I'm on, uh, I get more uh, like stage fright, if you will, or something. Sure, and, sure. Um, sure. Freeze up. So um, the other question that I had was like, is there anything that you really do want to get to uh, and would be bummed if after this, like we we missed or didn't get to talk about. Um, well, not in particular. I mean, I, I would. You did an interview with Mike Mangione already, or are going to? Uh, going to, yeah. That'll be. Uh, going he, to. He wasn't available uh, until next month, so yeah. Yeah, I would love to. T I mean, if we if we did a. Um, a conversation about you know what music or art or movies have meant to me and how I've incorporated them into what I do mm. uh, and then that would naturally lead into a conversation about our event called made for more and what that is all about that'd be Perfect. great if it doesn't naturally go in that direction that's totally fine oh no uh, we can um, we can definitely bring that in I think it's super relevant to uh, you know to the whole yeah. community here so I one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on was just to like um, get the word out to our community about that and about what you guys are doing. So, uh, yeah, and give me a sense of your community. I have a sense of it, but who who's the average person who's listening? Yeah, it it'll be probably a. Uh, it's actually kind of wide in that the whole creative. Uh, the definition of creativity is one that we wanted to really like push into a broad uh, definition of like what it means to be human. So uh, there's it started with just artists and designers uh, who are all millennial, but um, it started to broaden out to also like uh, entrepreneurs and uh, usually at 35 and under, um, but in general, uh, people who are very serious about their faith. Uh, who've grown mm -hmm. up with probably most of the people here will have heard about theology of the body and have um, like gone to youth group or had experiences of learning about it and probably know who you are. Um, mm -hmm. have heard talks or even been to your talks, um, but who are uh, just as they have gotten into this community, they're here because they feel like it's a place where um, their Catholic faith and their artistic kind of center or their um, their creative mind uh, is able to be there. Those things are like brought together uh, in this kind of space. So um, a lot of them f will have felt at some points like alienated from the church uh, because of that part of them um, or just because mm -hmm. they haven't been able to like experience a church that is, you know, erotic um, and, right. uh, and, are really dreaming for uh, a more beautiful church because of that right now. So yeah, that's, um, I don't know if that gives you a, an image. Very helpful. So yeah, but that's it. That's the, the community. So, so it's uh, 20s and 30 somethings. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
So I'm an old I'm an old man to this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's uh, that's quite. You know, old is is a very uh, it's a moving target. I'm realizing because now that I'm yeah. uh, past thirty, it's uh, I'm starting to redefine that for myself a little bit. <laughs> right, right, right. So okay, um, what why why don't we just start with like who are you? Uh, what are people? Uh, when when you when people ask you like what are you doing who are you what are you about like what do you tell them? I tell them I have the greatest job in the world. I get to lead hungry people to a banquet. That's what I do. It's all about the ache. I call it the ache. Uh, I was eight years old the first time I felt it in a really memorable, powerful way. Powerful way. I was lying in my bed. This is ni- the nineteen seventies listening to uh, Bruce Springsteen on the radio singing his 70s anthem called Born to Run. And at the end of this song, he just cracks open his rib cage and he lets this cosmic cry come out of his heart. This man is looking for something. He's, he's running for it. He's looking for it. And, and when I listen to this song, eight years old, something ginormous rumbled through my soul. And I didn't even know what it was. I just knew I was made for something big. There was some big mystery that I was part of. Tragically, in my Catholic upbringing, nobody ever connected the dots for me between that experience I had listening to that Springsteen song or the experience I had when Stacy Reed finally got to sit next to me in third grade after three years of waiting for the nun to re- arrange the room so that Stacy Reed would be next to me. Uh, <laughs> nobody connected the dots for me between that, that wild passion I felt, that adrenaline, that, that, that rush, that, that ache, a longing, a hunger for something, and religion. You know, religion class could be described with one word, boring, that's, that's religion. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't until I discovered St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body in 1993 so I was 24 years old at the time, that somebody told me this ache I felt, this passion I felt deeply in my bones has a name. It's called Eros. What a shocker to to find out that (laughs) what I had been feeling all along, the church calls it Eros. And, And not only does it have a name, but it's a yearning for the infinite. And here's here's what I learned from St. John Paul II. This is my own analogy, but I got the teaching from him. I I like to put it this way. God gave us eros, uh, like to be like the fuel of a rocket that has the power to launch us to the infinite truth, goodness, and beauty for which we long, right? That's That's how the Greeks defined eros, the yearning of the human heart for the true, the good, and the beautiful. But here's the tragedy of original sin. With original sin, our rocket engines got inverted. This is why so many of us go out into the world looking for love, looking for joy, looking for fulfillment, but it all backfires on us. And and this is the part that really changed my life. I felt like John Paul II was talking right to me, and he says, Christopher, here's the good news of the gospel. Christ came into the world not to condemn those with inverted rocket engines. He came into the world to redirect our rocket engines to the stars. And I knew then I would spend the rest of my life studying this theology of the body and, and inviting people into it, inviting them to redirect their rocket engines to the stars. So the arrows leads to the true, the good, and the beautiful, and not to crashing and burning. So that's what I do. I, I lead people to a banquet in their hunger and I redirect their rocket engines. <laughs> that's awesome, man. So when you were when you were in high school and you experienced the uh, the rocket engines, but they were still inverted, like <clears throat> what were you what were you directing them at? Uh, well, I was about to say sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but it, uh, not so much the drugs part. I did you know I did get into the alcohol uh, quite a bit, but I had an older brother who was uh, very much into drugs. And I saw the damage that that did to him, and I didn't want to go down that path. But yeah, sex and rock and roll, um, that, was, that was my outlet. I was in a lot of bands as a teenager. And uh, like most guys my age, teenage years, this was the 80s for me, uh, I, was, 
I was on a race with my guy friends to see how far we could go with the girls. Uh, and and it, it wreaked a lot of havoc on, on my life and the life of the lives of other people as well. It was kind of um, the real wake up call for me was freshman year of college when I did a little experiment. I decided to stay sober for one weekend to see what would happen. I wanted to see what was really going on on the campus. And I began to wonder the whole get drunk, get laid mentality. I was like, is this really bringing happiness? So I said, okay, I'm gonna stay sober to check out what's really going on. So I remember it very clearly. My roommate came back from a party very drunk and vomited all over our dorm room. And it smelled so bad I had to go find somewhere else to sleep. As I'm leaving my dorm room behind, I'm looking back at my roommate passed out in a puddle of his own vomit. And I'm thinking, is this happiness? Is he having a good time, really? And I found an open door down the hall, put my blanket and pillow on the floor. And this guy comes back to the room with a girl, doesn't know I'm on the floor, and proceeds to try to have his way with this, this girl. And I, I won't get into all the sordid details, but what happened that night was pretty horrific. And it compelled me, compelled me to ask some really, really big questions about the meaning of life, about the meaning of sex, about the meaning of our desires. And I, I remember Anthony being pissed at God if he even existed. And this was the ragged prayer that came out of my heart. It's like, okay, God, if you exist, you better show me why you gave me all these desires because they're getting me and everybody I know into a hell of a lot of trouble. What is your plan? Yeah. And that was the beginning of, of a long journey that I'm still on uh, that led me to discover John Paul II's theology of the body. And find my wife and find my mission in life. And uh, yeah, I, I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. I don't even remember what the question was, but whatever it is, that, that was my answer. Yeah, it was about the rocket engines getting inverted. So like- uh, Oh yeah, where did I aim it? Where did I aim it? You know, this is something interesting though. What I've seen in my journey is those things that I aimed Eros at in a disordered way you know, these are the things that get redeemed in our lives if we allow the Lord into those places. It's so important we understand that Christianity is not holding out redemption from the body, but redemption of the body. It's not redemption from Eros. It's the redemption of Eros. And, and this is another very important thing of, of what I would call Catholic cosmology. Hmm. The devil doesn't have his own clay. What does this mean? It means the only clay that exists is God's clay. And God looked at everything he made and said, behold, it is very good. The enemy gets in there, sin gets in there and twists up that clay. But the solution here is not to throw the clay away. The solution is to untwist that clay. For example, I listen to a lot of you know, what, what most believers, most Catholics would consider uh, perverse music growing up mm -hmm. uh, in, in my teenage years. But, but look at the very word perverse. If something is perverse, it means there was original, there was a goodness that got perverted, right? Redemption untwists what gets twisted up. And so a large part of my adult life has been reclaiming the art that used to attract me as a teenager. There was a reason I was drawn to the art I was drawn to. And even if some of it was, was twisted up, there's some goodness in there that got twisted. And purity of heart allows us to, to see through what's been twisted up into the original goodness that got twisted up. That's a very, very important part of, of understanding a Catholic or sacramental worldview. We start with a fundamental basic goodness of everything. And then we recognize, okay, how has the goodness gotten twisted up and how can it be untwisted? So you were a, uh, you were a band kid uh, or in bands, a rock and roller when you were a, like a young I man. I was indeed. And uh, I, I was as well. I was a, I, it was a different time, you know? So like for us, it was like emo music and punk rock and right. uh, all of that. But uh, I, I just remember um, in a similar way, like having this 
when I first started to listen to these uh, these songs, like just this intense, like nostalgic experience of passion was like inflaming me. Um, and I took that and ran so hard into the direction yep. of, uh, of playing music because that was where I experienced it. Um, and then uh, the way that that, like as an artist got really twisted for me was, um, I just felt like as a human being, you know, so I was this homeschooled kid that was super nerdy and then got, you know, picked on a lot whenever I went to public school. And then uh, I saw music as like a way for me to um, to prove myself to like gain popularity and glory and uh, and also to like get girls and people to like me, you know, yep. it was like my yep. uh, and it it definitely jumped out of that whole uh, connection to the divine or the eros that I had had felt in that beginning stage of adolescence and just became something really flat and empty. Um, and I'm wondering if you had any experiences like similar to that where you were playing uh, your music or like got to do a show or something and and uh, felt the difference between your like desire when you heard Bruce Springsteen and what was present now? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you're the first person ever to ask me a question just quite like that. And I'm remembering a very specific experience. It was 1990, I was a drummer in a band. We were playing a gig at Penn State University, a frat party. And, and these were the kind of gigs that, <laughs> uh, yeah, talk about sex and rock and roll. Um, the goal, I mean, for most of the guys in the band, the goal was to get up on stage so you could then get in bed at the end of the night. Right. Uh, I had a girlfriend at the time and, and I had some semblance of wanting to remain faithful to her. So I did not pursue it at that degree. But I remember, see, I'm, I'm the drummer, I'm in the back, I'm up on the riser and I'm looking at the lead singer connecting with this girl out in the audience. And I knew where it was going to go. I knew what he was doing. He was seducing her to get into bed with him at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. And I remember the next morning, he came back to the guys in the band, like with triumph that he had gotten the girl to bed. And I remember the sinking feeling in my heart, Anthony, like, yeah, but what about her? Mm -hmm. That's a person. And, and you just treated her as a conquest. And it, it was, it was a big kind of, it really was, I, even in, in I, I thank you for asking the question because I don't think I've spent a lot of time with this memory and, and just remembering this right now, I'm remembering it was a turning point for me. Like there's gotta be a better way to direct our hunger. There's gotta be a, a better way to direct Eros. I mean, the, think about it. It is no coincidence that the sexual revolution and rock and roll music have coincided, mm -hmm. right? You could even say rock and roll is the soundtrack of the sexual revolution. Yeah. Um, you know, right as the sexual revolution is getting underway, it needed, the, what people were feeling needed also to be expressed in art and in music. And there's Elvis Presley on the Ed Sullivan show shaking his hips, but they won't even show him uh, from the waist down, you know? Mm -hmm. um, talk about a different time and a different era. Uh, but the goal here, I would say, is not to go back to pre-1950 America. Right. Because if we went back to pre-1950 America, the sexual revolution would happen all over again. <laughs> yeah. Because the sexual revolution is an understandable response to the puritanical approach to the body and sex that was so common uh, 50, 60, 100 years ago. You know, 100 years ago, when a woman showed up in public, she had to wear something like 25 pounds of clothing to be considered <laughs> respectable. Yeah. You know, 100 years later, we're going to the exact opposite extreme. So sexual revolution happens. The soundtrack is rock and roll. I even heard once that the very term rock and roll is a euphemism for the sexual act. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. pause. <laughs> if you have a proper Catholic cosmology, a proper understanding that the devil does not have his own clay, then what we're going to recognize here is that the sexual revolution was an expression of disordered passion. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so too is the soundtrack that goes along with it. Rock and roll music is so often an expression of disordered passion. The puritanical, fearful approach to all of that is to say passion is bad, throw it away. Rock and roll music is bad, throw it away. Yeah. But the Catholic response is to untwist what's been twisted up. Mm -hmm. Every rock song that is full of lust and lustful passion, you could say, is a broken attempt to sing the greatest of all erotic love songs, which is smack dab in the middle of the Bible. Yeah. The Song of Songs, right? The saints have written more commentaries on this erotic love song in scripture than any other book in the Bible. Why? Why? Because they see in true erotic love, got to qualify, true erotic love, they see the proper image of the way God loves us. And this is what breaks through even in, well, let me just quote Bruce Springsteen himself. Here Can we I go. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go right. there. <laughs> so I'll tell you this experience, Anthony. It was 30 years after I had that experience with Bruce Springsteen. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching Bruce Springsteen induct U2 into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. And U2 is, is U2's my number one favorite band ever. Springsteen's got to be number two. So this was like a night to remember for me when Springsteen's bringing U2 into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But listen to what he says. I quote him here in my, in, uh, my book, Fill These Hearts. He says, a great rock band, and we got to underscore great rock band, right? Yeah. Because there are a lot of ungreat rock bands, right? <laughs> but a great rock band, he said, searches for the same kind of combustible force that fueled the expansion of the universe after the Big Bang. They want the earth to shake and spit fire. They want the sky to split apart and for God to pour out. Then he paused and he said a bit sheepishly, it's embarrassing to want so much and expect so much from music, except sometimes it happens. And that's, that's exactly what happened to me in 1978 when I was lying in my bed listening to Springsteen himself on the radio. The sky split open and God <laughs> fell out. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. Art and in a particular way, music. Uh, and, and I'd say a close second in the modern world is movies. Music and movies. Good, good art, good movies. And what do I mean by good? I mean honest, honest art. And, and, and I would consider Springsteen, for example, I mean, I don't agree with Springsteen's politics. I mean, mm -hmm. that's another conversation altogether. I don't agree with a lot of Bono's theology, right? He's a believer. I don't agree with all his theology, but that's another conversation. What rock and rollers like these guys are doing, Springsteen, Bono, Peter Gabriel, these are the kind mm -hmm. of people I grew up listening to. They're just opening up what's going on in there the good, the bad, and the bad and the ugly, they're looking at it and they're expressing it. They're getting it out in an honest way. And it's messy and it's brutally honest, but that, that, that's the stuff that really goes on in our human lives. This is the kind of stuff that, that Christ came to enter into and to redeem. And I love this quote from St. Augustine. I share it often. He put it this way. He said, those who are lost in their passions are actually less lost than those who have lost their passions. Fascinating. Yeah. Those who, have those who are lost in their passions are less lost than those who have lost their passions. Why are they less lost? Now, they're still lost. Don't get me wrong. They're still lost. But why are they less lost? Because they feel the ache. They feel the hunger. They feel that thing called Eros. And Eros, as Pope Benedict XVI said, Eros is the yearning in us that seeks the face of God. It, 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 we got to feel it first. You know, who came running to Jesus 2,000 years ago? Was it the religious do-gooders who might have been following all the rules but weren't really in touch with the wildness inside? 
Or was it the addicts and the prostitutes and the, the, the sinners and tax collectors? Why did these people come running to Jesus first? Because they were people of passion and they felt the hunger. They were just taking it to the wrong place. Uh, another you know, place to look in scripture for this is the, the prodigal son parable. You know, we have the dutiful older brother who followed all the rules, but at the end of the day, he wouldn't even enter the party that the father was throwing, right? That's an image of heaven. What was it that led the son away? Not a hypothetical me. question. Okay, okay. I was like, was that a dramatic pause or? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking you, what, what was it that led the younger son to leave the father's house? Uh, I don't know. I don't feel like I have. It a... was his hunger. It was his passion. Yeah. Right? He thought he was going to satisfy his passions out in the world. And what was it that led him back to his father's house? Not being able to. Exactly. The same thing. His hunger. Right. His passion. His yearning. That's led him away from the father. It led him back to the father. That's my story. It led me. My passions led me away from the Lord. And those same passions, those very same passions led me back. Yeah. Christianity is for hungry people. That's what our faith is. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, Jesus says, for they shall be satisfied. There's that, um, you know, stay thirsty kind of uh, mantra yep. that's out there, which I, I kind of love. And you're definitely a man that exemplifies that hunger. Um, so I have a couple questions that I want to ask around that. Like one is, yeah. uh, how do you stay hungry? How do you stay thirsty? How do you cultivate that? Um, and then two, I want to ask in, in contrast to the last question about uh, the disordered engine, uh, the disordered engines that you had, your desires that were pointing you away. I'd love to hear like some contrasting experiences where uh, you were just swept away by totally ordered, beautiful, uh, sure. experiences of Eros. And maybe those two questions um, can have the same answers. I don't know, but you can answer yeah, those, those in whatever are... order you want. Well, uh, Anthony, it takes one to know one. The very ability you have to articulate those questions uh, reveals to me that you're in touch with the ache. Hmm. Um, so first question, what, uh, remind me, I'm so sorry. I got stuck stay, on the second one. How do you stay hungry? How do you stay hungry, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm... I'm <laughs> I'm immediately reminded of song lyrics all the time. And the, the lyric that just popped in my head is from another Springsteen song, Dancing in the Dark. He says, they say you got to stay hungry. Hey, baby, are in the night. I mean, that, that's, that could be like the anthem of my life. I have always felt this hunger. How do you, how do you stay hungry? Well, I mean, especially because you're like, you're out there working in one of yeah. the most drudgery like if i if i could point at any place where it's the hardest to stay hungry it's in professional ministry like <laughs> that is a very hard place to stay hungry uh so how do you do that yeah i i would say by not settling for false this is a quote from pope benedict false infinities hmm. and what does he mean he says Eros is a yearning for the infinite, but we often settle for false infinities, for, for things in this world, pleasures in this world that promise satisfaction of, of the hunger. Uh, well, I, I've been down that road. I, I've tried everything there is to take away the ache. And I have to be honest with myself, at the end of the day, the ache is still there. And when I say I've tried everything, I don't just mean illicit pleasures. I'll, I'll tell, tell you this story. I, I love my wife dearly. We've been married 20, going on 23 years. We have five beautiful children. Um, and I understood theologically, I understood in my head in 1995 when I got married that my ultimate fulfillment could only be God. I was, I was already studying this theology of the body. I was already teaching it and I was trying to live it in, in my marriage. And you know, let me back up here and say the Bible begins with the marriage of man and woman, but it ends with the marriage of Christ and the church. And Jesus says in the resurrection at the end of time, we're no longer going to be given in marriage. Why? 
Because the purpose of marriage is to be a sign that points us to the eternal destiny. Mm -hmm. We got to be very careful that we are not aiming our desire for ultimate happiness at the sign of ultimate happiness. And when I got married, I was really in some ways bent towards my wife. And my wife was in some ways bent towards me. And we were expecting one another to take away the ache. Mm -hmm. We were expecting one another to satisfy our deepest desires for love and happiness. If marriage teaches you anything, it teaches you that no human being can bear that burden. But it's usually a long and very painful journey of learning how to take your heavy hands off one another and stop demanding that the other person be perfect. So my point here is, especially in a good marriage, and I would say my wife and I have had a, a wonderfully good marriage, not without its pains and trials and sorrows, but we've had a wonderfully good marriage, and there's a particular temptation in a good marriage to, to, to think that you found what you're looking for. Mm. So how do we stay hungry? Yeah. We have to be convinced that there's, there is something more than what this world has to offer. And here, if I may quote again from one of my rock and roll heroes, Bono, <laughs> His song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Yeah. Right? There's this line yeah. in there where he says, and he's he, he's a believer. He really believes Jesus is the son of God. And, and so Bono is singing, uh, I believe in the kingdom come. I believe all the colors will bleed into one. But yes, I'm still running. And then he says, you broke the bonds and you loosed the chains. You carried the cross and all my shame. And then he says, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Now, when this song came out in the 1980s, uh, and I was, I was following the band at the time, and, and Christians were up in arms. You know, People had been trying to figure out, is he a true believer? Uh, and then when this song came out, they're like, oh, he's not a true believer. Because if you found Jesus, you found what you're looking for. Okay, pause a minute. Christianity does not provide utopia on this earth. It doesn't. And in fact, the catechism says kind of the litmus test between a true gospel and a false gospel is precisely this. Mm -hmm. Is it offering perfect happiness now? If it proposes perfect happiness now on planet earth, it's not the gospel. Mm -hmm. What the gospel proposes is not fulfillment here. What the gospel proposes is the hope, the true and living hope of fulfillment in the next life. So when Bono says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, even though he found Jesus, what he's saying is, I'm made for another world. C.S. Lewis put it very well. He says, if you find desires in yourself that cannot be satisfied by anything in this world, then it only makes sense that you're made for another world. So how do we stay thirsty? How do we stay hungry? We got to have the courage to look at how deep the ache really goes. And if we do that, we will discover what St. Augustine discovered 1,700 years ago. And here he gives us perhaps the greatest statement uh, of Christian anthropology ever articulated. And I stole that line from Bishop Barron. I think it's true. Here it is, the greatest statement of Christian anthropology ever articulated. You have made us for yourself, O oh God, and our hearts are restless till we rest in you. That rest does not come till the next life. So in this life, we're going to be restless if we're really in touch with our hearts. Here's another way I try to stay thirsty by exposing myself to the beauty that pierces my heart. Because nothing, nothing pierces the heart like beauty. And for me, that's in good music, that's in good movies, that's in getting my butt out of my office and getting out into nature. Uh, I'm a big fan of backpacking, I'm a, a big fan of skiing, 
I'm a big fan of being out in God's creation. I'm a big fan of giving my kids opportunities to see the stars in the summertime. Uh, I'm a big fan of of getting my kids in water. And I don't mean chlorinated water. I mean creeks and streams and lakes and ocean, oceans, right? Uh, I'm a big fan of feeding uh, the hunger for beauty in the right way. Because beauty, like nothing, nothing else, whether it's a sunset or a starlit night or a great movie or a great song, cracks open our hearts and gets us in touch with that longing for something more. We, we, I, I love what Pope Francis says. He says, he says, I'm going to ask you two questions. Do you have a heart that desires or are you asleep? Are you anesthetized? That's question number one. And, and I love etymology. I'm always looking up words to see what words really mean. And that word anesthetized, do you know what it means, Anthony? Numb. Numb to beauty. Interesting. That is so Numb interesting. to beauty. Isn't that fascinating? Look it up. Yeah. You, you know, you talk about a creative type has an aesthetical sense, right? We say he has an aesthetic sensibility. Well, anesthesia means you're numb to beauty. You don't have a sensitivity to beauty. It's very important. If we're going to stay hungry, if we're going to stay thirsty, we have to cultivate that sensibility to beauty. Otherwise, we're anesthetized. And then Pope Francis's second question is this. He says, what is the thing in your life that pulls at your heart like a magnet? And he says, we got to get in touch with that. For me, that's beauty, the beauty of music, the beauty of people, the beauty of good conversations like this one, the beauty of art, the beauty of stories, the beauty of nature. These things keep me hungry. When I am, um, something that that reminds me of, I guess, from a, a big sort of turning point in my own life, uh, been this last year, had started Catholic Creatives and uh, 2015, started my own business, started Catholic Creatives with a, a few friends, and both of those were incredible uh, incredible experiences of risk and of uh, personal growth. Um, and there's just so much work that went into that, uh, went into both of them. And uh, I've been doing youth ministry and just uh, really inside the church before that. And uh, there's this just explosion of, of uh, kind of, yeah, pressure on me in in both of those and it it put me into this grind where uh i just was working and very anxious about um very anxious about myself honestly like uh all of a sudden having a little bit more of like a public image um there yes. was all of this um insecurity that had always been there but was just like yes. multiplied by the eyes that were on me and yes uh all of a sudden, I just realized that that pressure was like causing me to work all the time to try and impress people and to like not yes. let people down and whatever. Um, and that stole my ability to rest in beauty, like recreation, uh, artistic inspiration, creativity is just like suffocated by um, suffocated by insecurity for sure. Uh, yes, yes. Also by the anxiety that comes from it. And I went on this retreat um, over New Year's break. All of my friends had uh, girlfriends that they were spending that time with. And uh, being a single guy, I was like, I, I better make this alone time like worth having or it's going to be really depressing. So I went into this, um, this beautiful cabin very far out from anywhere that uh, it was just totally unfamiliar, total awesome. uh, exploration. And the space that I experienced there for like reawakening my heart was just Woo! like unbelievable. And I'm sitting there out, like looking over a sunset. Um, it was on the top of this hill. This cabin was on the top of a gigantic ridge of hills that like went down into a, an open plain. And you could just see out for miles and miles and miles. The sky was as wide and as gorgeous as it can only be in Texas. Uh, in the hill country and you could smell cedar in the wind awesome and uh the i i just felt in my heart like 
connection to my boyhood. And I felt like God was saying to me, why would you ever miss this? Like you have yes. this every single day, every morning and every night. Like, why is that not the most important part of your day? You know, like, what are you looking for that's so important? Like, you can be completely satisfied and totally enraptured in just something as simple as this sunset. Uh, and I just came back and was like committed. Like, this ha I need to arrange my day, arrange my meetings so that I can just be outside and catch the sunset. <laughs> Amen, brother. And uh, Amen. it's changed my You're life. It's changed my life. Of something. <laughs> You're reminding me of something I want to share. Mm -hmm. I, in order, in order to get my students in touch with their hearts, and this is what I often find in my students, that they're so disconnected from their hearts, and they come to study theology with me, and a lot of times they think it's going to be an academic exercise, and I don't have anything against academic theology per se, and in the courses I teach, we do some serious academic work, but the purpose of information is transformation. And the information will do us no good unless we're opening our hearts to transformation. And I often find I got to help my students get in touch with their hearts. And in order to do that, I often have to take them through some exercises that will get them in touch with the things they loved very naturally as a child. Hmm. And I'll say to them, where was your favorite place in your backyard when you were a little boy or a little girl or the favorite place in your park down the street or where was your favorite place as a child to take a vacation to get them beginning to reconnect with their hearts uh, this is so so important um, the, the 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 beautiful things in God's creation that children are very naturally attracted to somewhere along the way we get taught that having that sense of childlike wonder is childish. Mm -hmm. and, and for example, I know, you know, the flowers are starting to bloom here, springtime in Pennsylvania, even though today it's snowing. It's April, what, April 9th, <laughs> I think, and it's snowing in Pennsylvania. That's why I'm all bundled up because my heater's not working in my office. But anyway, the, the flowers are beginning to come out. And my, my nine year old daughter, Grace, uh, she, check this out. She made these. Oh, man, that is awesome. <laughs> she was four years old when she made these. Check, I have them on my desk all the time. She made them out of construction paper when she was four years old. Aren't they amazing? Chris, come on. He's holding up a, uh, a bouquet uh, of flowers. Uh, like pay Made out of construction paper. Yeah. And, and my, my daughter made those when she was four years old. She's now nine. And anyway, the, when the flowers come out, she she goes berserk she loves 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 the flowers and she'll come running in the house and she says the flowers are out the flowers are out and i'll say i know and she'll say how do you know and i'll say because there's pollen all over your face <laughs> why is there pollen all over her face because she's been burying her face in the flowers right this is awesome and i never ever i hope when she's 35 and 85 that she's still burying her nose in flowers, that she never loses that childlike wonder. Why does this get bred out of us? Because somewhere along the way, somebody tells us we're stupid, or you're being stupid, or that's stupid, or whatever. Um, you know, think of what happens to a toddler when you turn music on. What's the toddler gonna do? The toddler's gonna dance, the toddler's gonna move, the toddler's gonna shake his body to the music. Well, somewhere along the line, that very natural response to music, somebody's going to say, you look stupid or you look like a dork. And that, that childlike freedom is going to be squashed. And these wounds go very deep in us, very deep in us. There's something so intimate to our persons when wonder is awakened, when when we're dancing, you know, school dances, why are people so afraid to get out on the dance floor? Because there's something inside that's so personal and intimate that we know is going to be exposed, right? Dance is a form of art. And art is the expression of the heart. I'll tell you a story. I was 17 years old. 
I was driving in my car on the highway, and I don't know why it's always Springsteen or U2, but a Springsteen song was on the radio. And I'm just driving along in the highway, and I'm feeling the music, and I am swaying behind my steering wheel to the music, and I was loving this music. And beside me on the highway comes this car full of teenage girls, and they honk the horn, and they all look over at me and mock the heck out of me. Mm. And the turtle went back in his shell, afraid and ashamed. And, and I have had, as an adult, <laughs> I have had to work through my rage at these girls for mocking me. I've had to forgive them for mocking me to, to get back in touch with a place in my heart that got shut down in that experience. Uh, when, you, when you enter into God's love song, and that's, that's really an apt metaphor for the Christian life, and, and I would even go so far as to say it's not merely a metaphor, because creation, for those with ears to hear it, creation is alive with the sound of music. Uh, Maria was correct. The hills are alive with the sound of music. <laughs> She's right. That's a, that's a mystic sensibility. She heard the love song of God in all of creation. That's sacramentality, right? But have you ever heard the expression, Anthony, those who hear not the music think the dancers mad? Yes. Oh, that is so true. Ah, oh. it, it's so when you're hearing this music, right? If you have ears that are open, and you, some of the listeners might be out there thinking, "Well, these are mostly creatives listening to this." So most of you people out there know what I'm talking about. But I know there are people out there who don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> and you're thinking, "Oh, I don't know what you're talking about, Christopher. God never sings to me." Yes, He does. Maybe your ears are clogged. Remember the scene in the Gospels where Jesus sticks his fingers in that guy's ears and he groans. Scripture says he groans and he says, Ephatha, be opened. Pope Benedict XVI said that that expression, be opened, when Jesus groaned and said that, he says that takes us to the heart of Christ's mission. He wants to open our ears so that we hear his love song he wants to open our eyes so that we see his beauty everywhere. He wants to awaken our hearts so that we are no longer anesthetized and asleep. And when we hear that music, you cannot help but dance to it. Mm. And sure enough, other people are going to think you're crazy because they don't hear the music. Indeed, <laughs> you know, if we're going to go with the uh, sound of music, the, the musical, what's the next song in the musical? It opens up with Maria hearing all this music in the mountains and dancing and singing The Hills Are Alive with the Sound of Music. And the next song comes from the nuns who like, don't get crazy. her. Yeah, yeah. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so she, she's a problem. Mm -hmm. she, to those who don't hear the music, the people who do hear the music, they're a problem. And they need to be silenced. They need to be squashed. They need to be stamped out. So anybody with an artistic, creative, poetic sensibility is going to suffer in this world mm. because you yearn for the rest of the world to hear what you hear, to see what you see, to feel what you feel. But you can't force anybody else to go on that journey. And, and the, the, this is why they killed Jesus. This is why they nailed him to a tree. Because he heard stuff, he saw stuff, and he was trying to share it with the world. And it's Jesus himself who condemns us when he says, "You, I played the flute and you did not dance, and I sang the dirge and you did not mourn. Mm. Right? And I think, uh, just speaking for myself, one of, the, one of the reasons it is difficult to get in touch with my heart and its deepest yearnings and desires and and how much beauty speaks to me. They're one of the reasons it's painful and difficult is because when you awaken your heart to beauty and goodness, at the same time, you're awakening your heart to sorrow 
and suffering. We played the flute and you didn't dance. We sang the dirge and you didn't mourn. Mm. Blessed are those who mourn, Jesus says, for one day they'll laugh. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirst, for one day they'll be satisfied. You can't have satisfaction without hunger. You can't have laughing and rejoicing without sorrow and mourning. You can't have the ecstasy of Easter Sunday without the agony of Good Friday. That's just how it goes. You cannot live unless you're willing to die. You cannot be rich unless you're willing to enter the depths of your own poverty. That's the human story. That's the gospel story. It's easier just to be numb. It's easier just to be ho-hum. But it's not the Christian life. We are called to, to wake up. We are called to, to, to sing back. We are called to, to enter into this divine love song and dance in step with it. That's the journey of the Christian life in a nutshell. I feel like it's like a return to the garden, you know, like. Amen. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> there's just this <laughs> like experience of covering up that has happened. Um, yes. I didn't look at that in myself, right? Like I, I had this innocence when I was a child and was so connected to like love, to the, the universe, to the divine, like to music and to dance and to stories. And I go to public school and holy shit, I am so not yep. cool anymore. Like, yep. And all of that engine towards the beauty became like pointed towards like, how can I make myself worth like yes. uh, being in relationship with? How can I make myself worth being loved? And the covering up was like this. Um, the covering up for me was all about like being cool, being masculine enough or being like, uh, you know, attractive enough. And yeah. um, it, I was covering up my own uh innocence like the purity of like just being willing to dance and uh, yeah i'll tell you this is really embarrassing to say um so i i was doing this personal retreat um i went back out into the same place that i uh, i went to in new year's to sort of un re uncover or uh, yes follow up the the insights that were sort of given to me and um I was, uh, I was editing this deeply difficult story uh, that we were filming that we had, uh, were just releasing this last week about um, Maximilian Kolbe's death. And so I'm working on that during the day and then at night I'm going out and I'm meditating in the woods about uh, Christ's passion. And at awesome. this one point, I felt like God was just telling me, like I made this fire and he was just like, I was listening to some music and, and he, God just was like, it's beautiful. I just want you to dance, just like dance. Mm. So I'm like in the woods, no one could see me. So it wasn't as embarrassing, but I just like a fool danced literally for an hour, like around Anthony, the fire. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. That is beautiful. That's your heart coming alive. That is your ears being opened to hear God's music calling you to dance. That is awesome. The real you, the real you behind the mess, behind the fear, behind the insecurities. That's the one God loves. The real you. And I think you nailed it when you said we we got to I would put it this way, we got to reverse the effects of the fall. Mm -hmm. And the first effect of the fall of the fall is hiding. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Well, if what Christ did is real, then the journey of the Christian life is reversing those effects of the fall where we can say, I was at peace because I know he loves me, so I exposed myself. Mm -hmm. I came out from hiding. I came into the light. That's the Christian witness. It's men and women coming into the light. If you, if you spend the rest of your life coming out into the light, Anthony, and dancing, and I mean that literally, but I also mean it as a metaphor for your life. If you come out into the world dancing, those who yearn for freedom will look at you and say, that man has a freedom I wish I had. 
And there will be also those who see that freedom in you and resent it because mm -hmm. they don't have it. I remember when I was a, a sophomore in high school. This is 1980, 80 what, 85, 86. And there was a freshman who was a really good actor. Like as a freshman, he got a lead in the school play. And this kid pissed me off because he was so free. He was so good at what he did and he was so unbound. I was so pent up. I was so bound up. And when I saw his freedom for years, people who were free pissed me off because they revealed to me my own lack of freedom. And I, I just, this was maybe four or five years ago. I used to be really cruel to him. I used to pick on him. I used to dump all my frustrations on him and anger on him. And just a few years ago, he kept appearing in my prayer life. Like I was having memories of how cruel I was to him. And I really believe the Lord started to show me why I treated him that way. Because underneath it, I was really jealous. Mm. Because he had a freedom that I wanted to have, but I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I looked him up. I, I Googled his name and turns out he still lives in the area. I looked him up. I took him out for, um, for coffee. And I, 30 years later, I asked him to forgive me. Wow. And I explained what I had been learning. And um, he remembered it and it had scarred him. And, and he was very grateful for, for, for me looking him up. But I was just following a grace that I felt. But I'm sharing this because it's, it's a little window into the, the vindications we're all going to have in eternity <laughs> and the justice that we'll have in eternity. Like the people who mocked the crap out of us for, for whatever reason, they, they will, it'll all come out into the light. Um, and I'll bet you, I'll bet you anything, Anthony, the people who mocked you, the people who bullied you, the people who were cruel to you, they saw something in you that they wished they had. And they were so angry that they didn't have it. They took out all their anger on you. How do I, how do I, how can I say that? Because that's who I was in high school. Mm. You, you were witnessing to them whether you knew it or not. And don't doubt it for a minute that your freedom and your creativity that was maltreated and mocked and whatever, don't think for a moment that that didn't plant seeds. That kid, when he got up on that stage, and shared his gift of acting. I was sitting out in the audience, and my reaction then was I was pissed off. But 30 years later, the seed that was planted through his artistic creativity turned into repentance in my life. Wow. And opened up a whole new understanding of my own journey. Mm. So any anybody who has that creative gift is going to suffer at the hands of those who are jealous, of those who are bound up. Uh, it just, it's part and parcel of being creative, of being artistic. You see things that others don't see. You have a freedom others don't see, and the world longs to have it. But rather than humble ourselves and say, can you teach me to be as free as you are, we heap our own crap and BS on people, and we cause people to suffer. Have you have you had any moments as you've been growing in your own freedom where you've been willing to be kind of weird to pursue your heart where you've just been like allowed yourself to be carried away by eros and yeah. by desire? Yes, yes, it's it's an interesting thing if you if you track my career as a, as a Catholic teacher and theologian you'll see how my books and my my public speaking and the courses I teach have evolved. And uh, I, I mean, I, it would be very interesting for me to go listen to some tape series that are floating out around out there somewhere <laughs> from the 1990s when I got started. And, and I'm sure, you know, like if you listen to the first album of one of your favorite artists who's matured over time, like I listened to the first U2 album from 1980, and you can hear the Bono that you know today, he's in there like in seed form. Mm -hmm. But he had to go through a whole process of maturation and coming into his gift and, and 
and learning how to share that gift in a deeper and more mature way. And and yeah, I can I can look back at my early writings or my or early teachings and see, yeah, the seed is there. But man, I, I was a pretty um I wasn't a very good dancer when I started off, put it that way. Uh, <laughs> and I, I came out in the 1990s with kind of both guns blazing and, and this theology of the body had changed my life, but I, I hadn't bumped up enough with my dance partner to learn how to, to speak to her in a way that I could really woo her and, and bring her into the dance in a, in a, in a smooth way. And it was pretty clunky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, to another angle to answer your question, you can see over the last 25 years of my work, I started to sing in yeah. my talks. I started to draw from movies. I started to draw from music. And I would start breaking into song in the middle of my lectures. And I remember when this first started to happen, it was like the early 2000s when I first started to like inspirations would come to me. I'd hear a song lyric and I'd sing it. And I noticed that when I opened my heart in that way to my audience, their hearts would open. Mm. Or I'd be in the middle of a presentation and I'd, I'd see a scene from a movie that illustrated the point I was trying to make. And I would share it with my audience. And I'd notice that their heart opened in a whole new way. And, and when I started off doing this work, it was just... It was just me speaking. Yeah. And I had a good ability to hold the attention of an audience even for hours. But what I'm doing now, like when I go into a parish, I have big screens behind me and, and certain lighting. When we do our, our event, it's called Made for More. And it's a production. It's an artistic production. There's live music, these big screens with movie clips. And we bring light in. We bring a, a you know, a production of lights in there to set a mood and create a feeling. Uh, it has evolved tremendously as I've gotten more in touch with my heart and become more creative and artistic myself. I have needed to draw from other artists, musicians, poets, dancers. Uh, I've had all of them perform at my events because art cracks open the heart. This is how we get in touch with who we really are. And that's sort of how your like partnership with Mike has kind of developed too. One of the things that I've loved about getting to experience you as an adult, you know, I this is funny because I actually got to track with you through a lot of that. I my dad being a Catholic speaker, like I was pretty yeah. aware of um, what you were doing. I I'm sure I think he he gave me your talks when I was hitting puberty. He was like, I don't know what to do with you here. Listen to Christopher West. You know? <laughs> 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 That's not true. My dad's awesome. But there was definitely that like Christopher West sure. was like the guy. Um, and uh, it definitely didn't, it never hit me um, like the way that it hit me when just recently I went to the Theology of the Body Congress and you like just startlingly like let out the the Bruce Springsteen song. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Where's this guy been for like, <laughs> where was he, yeah. you know? And I'm sure it took courage for you to like allow yourself to, to do that or to try it. Like what a vulnerable thing. It's, yeah, it is vulnerable and uh, it's fascinating. I, I would love to talk to you more about what you have observed here in my tapes years ago and then seeing what I'm doing today. It, 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 I have been on a journey. Anybody who has been tracking what I'm doing ha would notice that I have been on this journey. And it's interesting. I think I remember the first time I, I, I let loose with that Springsteen howl at a, at a presentation. And I just remember saying, I'm going for it. I'm going for it. I <laughs> we're know doing it live. <laughs> we're doing it live, baby, because I know that the people who have ministered to me the most are the people who have been willing to crack it open and be vulnerable. And, and when, when someone goes first, when someone says, I'm willing to be vulnerable first, it inspires other people to crack open their rib cage and be vulnerable. Mm. So are people going to mock me? Are people going to misunderstand me? I'm sure they are, and I'm sure they do. And uh, I, I, be <laughs> I remember one, I got this, this letter. Uh, no, how did I get? Oh, somebody, somebody forwarded an email to me that somebody else had written about me. Oh no! And it's and it's <laughs> it said something like this. It said, 
if Christopher West breaks into one more song from the 80s, the 70s or 80s at his talk, I, I, I won't be able to bear it. <laughs> and I get it. I get it. But, you know, my, my point, I always say this to my audience. I said, when I break into a Springsteen song or a Bono song or whatever, my point is not to turn people into Springsteen fans. My point is to give them permission to get in touch with the music that ministers to them. I remember this was uh, 14 years ago. I was getting to know my spiritual director for the first time. And uh, I, I've had the blessing of having this beautiful priest journey with me for the last 14 years. And he said to me, you know, when he was just first getting to know me, he says, Christopher, tell me about your prayer life. What are your, what are your strengths and what are your distractions? And, and I said, oh, you know, one of the biggest distractions I have, when I go to pray, I start hearing all these songs in my head. And he said, oh, oh yeah, what, what, like what? And I said, oh, like Springsteen, Beatles music, U2. And, and I, I'm trying to listen to God, and I start hearing all these pop songs. <laughs> and he says, he says to me, you ever, think, uh, you ever think that might be the Lord trying to speak to your heart? I said, no, never. <laughs> it's a distraction. I'm trying to listen to God, and this stuff gets in the way. And he says, well, um, was that music important to you growing up? I said, well, sure. I mean, it's the stuff I grew up on. He says, you don't think the Lord knows the language of your heart? Mm. I had never thought of that. He said, the next time that happens, the next time you go to pray and you hear a song speak to you, listen to the lyrics. Or maybe that song is connected with a certain memory in your life that the Lord wants to speak to you about. Anthony, that changed my life. Mm. I, I had no idea that for years... God was trying to speak to me in a language that I could relate to and understand. My, my hyper pious Catholic upbringing taught me that couldn't possibly be God. Mm -hmm. But what I have since learned is God, of course he does. He knows the language of our hearts. He knows the language of your heart, Anthony. How, how's he going to, he's going to speak to you in the language of your heart. Again, my goal is not to make everybody a fan of the movies that I like or a fan of the music that I like, but I quote from the movies and the music that I like in my books and in my teaching to give people permission to get in touch with the stories, the songs that minister to them. Because we all have a soundtrack to our lives. We all have certain stories that have spoken to us, movies that we go back to as our kind of go-to stories, our I mean, this may sound weird to the rest of the world, but I cannot understand my life, the story of my life, apart from Rocky Balboa. <laughs> yeah. I can't. <laughs> this guy, Rocky Balboa, is in my blood. That's so awesome. <laughs> all right, all right. I'm going to share something with you, Anthony, because yes. you and your audience alone, or not alone, but will be part of the, the, the small crowd that will actually get this. So I'm watching my mother for a, a Christmas present bought me a special edition of Rocky that has all these special, you know, behind the scenes interviews. And I mean, I devoured this. It was like seven hours of special <laughs> features. Awesome. And I devoured this. I'm a Rocky junkie because of how how much this movie and the soundtrack of the Rocky movies has ministered to me so profoundly. Okay, I'm going to this was I'm just going to play a 1 minute clip for you that I have on my phone here. This is Bill Conti. He is the the uh, conductor and, and the, uh, the he did the soundtrack for Rocky like Da 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 right the Rocky theme music. Yeah. This is the guy who wrote it. And I'm I'm gonna put this right up to my microphone here so you can hear what he says. It's just a minute clip. Listen to this. Hang on. Let me get it. Here we go. Can you hear it? Now when they go into final rounds, then you hear bong, bong. Da 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 da. All of a sudden, a little fugue is beginning, but the strings are always elegant. They are noble. They are da 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 da. They're playing.
playing a few. All of this is going on at the same time where guys are getting bloody and cut me, Mick. What is that? Because I don't care about cut me, Mick, and blood. I care about the nobility of the sacrifice of the mass. <gasps> How could you? No. See, it's none of your business what I'm thinking about when I'm writing music. I write music because it has an impact on me. It feels to me like a death and a rebirth. It seems to me like a renaissance, like a, like a mass, like a, a sacred thing that's going through that moment. And if you got it, if you got something special out of that, then it works. Is that not amazing? That's amazing. Wow. The Rocky theme song is based on the mass. Wow. That's right out of the math, the mouth of Bill Conti, the guy who wrote the Rocky theme song. He's thinking about death and resurrection when he's writing the music of these guys getting bloody and beat up in the ring. I'm telling you, if we under, if we understand a Catholic sacramental view of the world, all the great stories, all the great heroes, I don't care if it's Luke Skywalker, Rocky Balboa, or, or, or whomever, you're going to find Jesus behind it because we are we are wired for the ultimate hero who is Jesus Christ. And this is back to my point that the devil doesn't have his own clay. Right? The logos is behind everything. The only clay that exists is God's clay and God made his clay to communicate the logos. The logos was made flesh. That logo what do we mean by logos? It means the logic behind everything the reason behind everything, the beauty behind everything, what you're attracted to when you go out on those, on those camping trips and you behold that sunset or you're dancing around that fire, what you're attracted to is the logos in creation. What you're hearing is the logos in creation because the logos is singing. The logos is everywhere. What is it that you like? I always ask people this. What is it that you like? Do you like pizza? Okay, behind that pizza, if you get into the deepest logic of that pizza, how tomatoes are grown, how cheese comes to be, you're going to find the logos. If you love wine and you get into the deepest logic of wine, you're going to find Jesus because he's the logos. If you love beer, if you love chocolate, if you love rocks, if you love trees, I don't care what it is. Do you love sex? Guess what? I'm not ashamed to say it. I have been fascinated by human sexuality since I was a little boy. And I come to find out the reason I'm fascinated by it is because I'm looking for Jesus because he's the logos and the one flesh union, as St. Paul says, is a great mystery that reveals Christ in the church. The logos is in and behind everything. Our problem is, Anthony, that we have these attractions to beer or sex or chocolate or, or the things we collect like stamps or rocks or whatever but we don't go deep enough. We stop, right? We stop at the surface and we don't press in deep enough. Press in deeply to anything you're attracted to. And if you go deep enough, you're gonna find Jesus. This is why Jesus, at the bottom of my attraction to rock music, is not the devil, because the devil's not at the bottom of anything. At the bottom of everything, is the creator of everything, the logos, through whom and in whom everything is made. If you think the devil is at the bottom of anything, and when I say the bottom, I mean like the ontological foundation, right? And here we have to have a proper understanding of, of ontology, which is the study of being. So the devil is not a god. The devil can't create anything. He's not creative. He's a plagiarizer. He's a mocker. He monkeys God's creation. He mocks it. He plagiarizes it. To be truly creative, you, you have to be able to bring something out of nothing, right? Only God can do that. So when we tap into the fact that we're made in the image of God, it is very natural for us to be, I would say, creative in a small C way. Mm. Only God is creative in a capital C way. But we are called to be creative in a small c way that is as images of god mm. and everyone everyone has the ability to be creative in his or her own way because everyone is made in the image and likeness of god the best gift that you have to give the world anthony 
is to live your creativity to the full, which is simply another way of saying to live in the image of God in which you're made. Mm. Because you, Anthony, are an unrepeatable beam of God's creativity from heaven. Nobody reveals the creativity of God the way you do. So if your creativity gets stifled, not only are you going to miss out on being the man you're created to be, but the rest of the world is going to miss out on the unrepeatable beam of God's glory that you are meant to reveal to the world. Man, that's so good. I've like teared up at least like six times as we've been talking, man. <laughs> it's like so good. It's so deep. Um, I want to hear like going back to your own personal experiences. Um, as you have been formed like by this uh, sort of template, all of these insights about uh, channeling your own creativity and starting to appreciate and uncover your own uh, instrument, your own song. Yes. Um, how in, in really practical, like the last couple of months, what have been things that you've actually done in your life, ways that you've changed your routines or your habits or things that you've done to like help to take uh to open your rib cage more to sing your song more to be more divinely uh creatively you yeah yeah uh, i would say without a doubt the number one source of that uncovering in my life of that we called it earlier getting naked right yeah uh, it's prayer it's learning to pray in an ever deeper way. And, and that doesn't mean deep prayer might at times be very dry. Um, no, no one would ever accuse Mother Teresa of a shallow prayer life. Mm -hmm. But she had long, long stretches in her life of, of real dryness in prayer, desert experiences. So, so we mustn't confuse depth of prayer with like emotional highs in prayer. But here's my favorite definition of prayer. I learned it from Pope Benedict XVI, who's just drawing from the fathers of the church. He says, the fathers of the church teach us that prayer, properly understood, is nothing other than becoming a longing for God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is getting in touch with eros, that ache, that longing, and learning to recognize that that ache and longing is a longing for God, and learning how to open up that longing for God to God. Mm. Because here are the two, the two temptations uh, with, with Eros. When we get in touch with that desire, when we feel it, the, the two temptations we have are to become either a stoic or an addict. What do I mean? The stoic represses the desire out of fear or whatever other motivation. I don't want to feel it. It's too scary. It's too deep. It's just going to get me in trouble. So I think the solution is, is bottle it up. That is not Christianity. The other temptation is to go the direction of the addict. The addict feels the desire, but indulges in finite pleasures, right? And if indeed Eros is a yearning for the infinite, if I take that desire to something finite, is it going to satisfy? That'll just cover it up for a little while. No, it's not going to satisfy. So what do I think I'm going to need? If I'm convinced this thing is supposed to give me fulfillment, but it didn't, what do I think I need? Uh, something else. <laughs> something else or more of that thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'll either go for something else or I'll go for more, right? It's always this more, 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 more. That's the path of addiction. So he, here's a, I call it a, a theological definition of addiction as opposed to a psychological definition of addiction. Addiction happens when we aim our desire for infinite joy at finite pleasures. We become addicted because they can never really satisfy. But there's another way, and here, and this is how, this is, this is how we should learn to pray. We must become aspiring mystics, not the stoic, not the addict. We must become aspiring mystics. We're all called to be mystics. And this doesn't mean we're all going to get the stigmata like Padre Pio. 
the, the catechism says those are the extraordinary signs of the mystical life. Mm. But the, the, the saints who experience that are given that, the catechism says, to indicate to all of us what we are called to, spiritually speaking. We are all called, the catechism says, to an ordinary mysticism. And that means learning how to open our desires for the infinite toward the infinite. And to go back to my previous image, it means letting God's grace into our inverted rocket engines to redirect them towards the infinite. So if we understand have, prayer, go ahead. Do, so do you, what, what is your like morning prayer routine? Look, do you wake up and then pray immediately or how do you actually do it? Yeah, typically, yes. Typically, I, I will start my day with prayer. I say typically because sometimes I have to get a, an early flight or whatever, and I'll have to pray later in the day. But um, yes, typically on a normal day, I will start my day with, uh, with prayer. I spend probably a half an hour in spiritual reading. Mm. Um, right now, I'm reading through St. Augustine's Confessions. Uh, I had studied sections of that years ago, but I had, had never read it through cover to cover, and I've always felt kind of ashamed that I hadn't. I'm a <laughs> theologian and I haven't read St. Augustine Confessions cover to cover. So I'm doing that. I'm finally finding it greatly enriching. Uh, I call Augustine the doctor of desire. Uh, I've, I've studied Augustine at, at some length. I just never read the whole thing straight through. And he, this man was in touch with his passions. Uh, he took them to the wrong place, but this is the grace of his life. He learned how to direct them. So yeah, spiritual reading for about half an hour. Then I will read the readings of the day. Uh, I'm a big believer in Magnificat. Uh, it just helps me to stay in touch with the prayer of the church in a very simple way. Um, and then I will spend time going through the prayer assignments that my spiritual director has given me on a month-to-month -month basis. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm laying out my heart to him every month. I'm telling him what my struggles are. I'm telling him what my 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 hopes and dreams are and I'm, I'm just being naked before my spiritual director and um he would he will give me little prayer assignments he'll say okay pray through this scripture or here's something in your your childhood you might need to look at or here's something in your marriage you might need to look at here's something in your fatherhood you might need to look at here's something in your ministry you might need to look at so i i thank god that i have a very wise and very gifted spiritual director who can tell me where to go and where to spend time, what to look at in prayer. And that has been absolutely invaluable. Is that all like and written I'll, down in a, you've like, during your spiritual direction, you write all of these different things down? Yeah, so during my out. spiritual direction, I will write down the prayer assignments he gives me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll just tell you one thing. This was back in November, so we're, we're in April now. In November, he was praying for me. I was with him, and he was praying for me. And he, and he said, he said, Christopher, I have this image of you out on the frontier. And you've cleared some land, and you've settled in, and you're in a good routine. You know, you're providing for your family out on the frontier. You've cleared enough land to make it work. But he said, there's a voice out in the woods calling you, and you're afraid to go out there. And, and he says, I want you to press in. Who is that voice? What is that voice? And he said, take that image to prayer and see what happens. Wow. So, okay, I took it to prayer. And, and his basic sense of it was, you're called to take more territory. Hmm. And it's an image he gave of my own heart, of my own spiritual journey. And this is always the danger. We make progress in our spiritual journey, and then we stop because we think we've made enough progress. <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> yep. But there's always more territory to take, but it can be scary because I don't know what's out there in those woods. And, and, and he saw this image of me with a gun, like I was walking out into the woods, but I was really afraid, like, <laughs> okay, what's out there? Am I gonna get shot? Am I gonna get killed? Is some wild beast gonna jump out and attack me? And and he saw this he saw this image. This is this is really weird, but this is how God works in my life. He saw this image from a Duran Duran video. I don't know if you've ever seen the video "Hungry Like the Wolf." I have not. But no. 
But the lead singer of this, this video is deeply ingrained in my mind and my heart from when I was like 14. And it's a, he, he's, the lead singer Duran Duran is running through the jungle and he's chasing this woman in the jungle who's got all this like warrior paint on her face. And he, he says to me, he says, Christopher, I think it's, I think it's Katiri Tekawitha. Uh, I, I, I think she's out there in the woods and, and she wants to take you on a journey deeper into the wilderness. And oh my gosh, Anthony, this opened the last four or five months. Katiri Tekawitha has taken me on a wild journey through this unexplored territory in my soul. Mm. It has been stunning the depth of insight that I'm getting into patterns of thinking I have that are rooted in fears, really rooted in my fear of death, mm. um, idols that I've had in my life of, of a certain type of woman or whatever that attracts my heart, that none of that is bad in and of itself. But if you latch on to these things, you know, the Lord wants our whole heart. Mm. And one of the things that's really been ministering to me is I did some research into K Katiri Tekakwitha's life. And uh, she, when she, she was a little girl, she had smallpox. Mm. And her face and whole body was terribly scarred by smallpox. And she used to hide behind a, a, a blanket because she was so mocked and ridiculed and shamed by her people because she was so hideous to look at. And, and she found acceptance in the Christian community and people loved her as she really was. And 15 minutes after her death, there were two eyewitnesses to this, two Catholic priests who 15 minutes after her death witnessed her face become uh, uh, as pure as like a newborn infant, like all the pockmarks cleared up. And they said her face was just radiating beauty. Hmm. And and this was this was the, one of the big takeaways for me in this journey with Katiri was that we can choose a a beauty in this life that leads to death. You know, we cling to the what the world says is beautiful, and if we do that, it leads to death. But if we are willing to die with the Lord, it'll lead to a beauty that lasts forever. Hmm. And so I started hearing this song in my head. Again, this is how God works through me, through music. A song that one of my bands used to play. Indeed, this band I was telling you about earlier, um, that where this lead singer was trying to get this girl in bed, we used to sing a song by The Clash called Death or Glory. And so I start hearing this song, Death or Glory, in my prayer. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Death or Glory, why is this in my head? And this is what I heard. Do you want the glory that leads to death? Or do you are you willing to embrace the death that leads to glory? Wow. Wow. And when I fall for certain idols in my life, I'm choosing an immediate glory that leads to death. Whereas if I'm willing to die in that moment to what I want in my idol, okay, I'm going to die, but it's going to lead to glory. So I don't know why I shared all that. Maybe it's going to mean something to somebody oh, no, out there. Oh, no, it means but... so much. That is so amazing. Uh, I just think that like being able to, to look into the mystical life of another mystic, like you don't know what all of it means. There's no way to be able to uncover in a short statement like that, the actual, um, like the depth of all of those metaphors and the way that God has been speaking to you. But just the um, being able to see how God is using metaphors uh, from your life to speak to you, like helps me to know what to listen for and look for. And like, yeah, when I'm in that landscape um, and there's a million different, you know, there's like an infinitude of different places that I could go in my meditations, like uh, being able to uncover and like see into your mystical life. It's like, Oh, that's, that actually could mean something like I could be, God could be speaking to me. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. If that serves no other purpose than that, Anthony, then I'm glad I shared it. And, 
I'm realizing we're kind of coming full circle here from what I was saying earlier mm -hmm. about how even rock music that's pretty twisted up can get untwisted. Yeah. Because that Duran Duran song, that very song warped my brain big, big time when I was 14 years old. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a song about, you know, getting this, getting this woman in bed. But anything and everything can be redeemed. Mm. Anything and everything can be redeemed. For everything that has an unholy expression, it can be untwisted and have a holy expression. Yeah. So, so this song that really messed me up as a teenage boy became mystical to me because it got it went through the it went through the the crucible. You know those yeah. those Plato things. You know, you squeeze it in there and it comes out a different shape. Mm -hmm. Like I, that Duran Duran song got stuck into that Plato presser outer, and it came out something holy. <laughs> it came out mystical. Yeah, it, it, I don't know how else to say it. It's it's actual poetry, man. Like your description of the um, your description of of the the woman like running through the forest, and then like Kateri Kekok with uh, and like chasing her through the forest. It's like yes, reframing beauty completely in a way. Yes, that's, like speaking directly into the heart not to like the head it's like yeah it's not the heart at that level it is straight it's not the head at that level it is a straight injection into the heart yeah yeah i love how I that's love the power of art that's the power of art yeah that's so beautiful so i hope that people who are listening to this take away like um that this is how god speaks and like there's such a freedom honestly like that you're giving me permission to have and to operate in that I just hope that everybody else listening to this is like uh, getting a little taste of. And I just want to thank you for like being willing to be the first to get naked, you know, like in, in leading, uh, leading all of us mm. young people who are artists and who are creatives who have like uh, in some ways following on this track that you've gotten to, to pave with your own spirituality and with your um, intellectual inquiry. So just so grateful to you for all of the work that you've put in, in, in your life. Like there is so much fruit that it's born in, in all of us and uh, is still bearing in the way that you're kind of leading. So just want to be Anthony, you are welcome. You are welcome. And I'll, I'll, I'll close with this line from that Duran Duran song which has been, I'm telling you, this, 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 law, this line from this song has been ministering to me so deeply in recent months. There's this one place where he says, burning the ground, I break from the crowd. I'm on the hunt, I'm after you. Okay, that has become pure mysticism to me because in order to go on this journey, we have to break from the crowd. Mm. We have to break from the crowd and we have to want to run so fast that we burn the ground. And we have to be hungry. We got to be hungry like the wolf. <laughs> Forgive me, but that's that's the how the song has been ministering to me. We got to stay hungry, uh, and and that hunger compels us on the journey. It's right in the first few lines of the Song of Songs. Come away with me. Let us run. Right. What was that song that first ministered to me when I was eight years old? Born to run. And the 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 song. The, the, the girl that he wants to run there with to this eternal destiny in that song, her name is Wendy. I married a woman named Wendy. I mean, that song has been mysticism to me my whole life. Wow. Someday. And tramps like us, baby, we were born to run. I feel it. It's in my bones. And pray for me because I want to run the race as if to win it. That's what I want to do. Thank you so much. Um, is for anybody that's that's still listening, where can they find you? Uh, what what should they look into if they're interested in like hearing more or seeing more of what you're doing? Sure, we're doing a lot of stuff through my ministry called the Core Project. That's C O R Latin for Heart. If you go to C O R Project dot com, don't go to C O R E project that'll take you to an apple orchard <laughs> but corproject.com uh, you can learn about uh my blogs and videos and we have a membership program where people can get ongoing information and i also teach five-day intensives 
on on living this out. If you were excited by you know the last hour and a half, uh, if you really want to dive in, come to one of my five day intensive courses at the Theology of the Body Institute. You can learn more about that at tobinstitute.org. Awesome, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll we'll see you uh, more in in connection to this community because I really think that you know when you had you and I had talked, I, I had shared a little bit about the um, the desire, like in I was placing myself in the in the role of David, you know, being in the wilderness and yes, uh, being this singer out there that like feeling like there was no other Samuel that could come and give yes. me permission to follow I remember that. that. Yes. And you had said, uh, I'm Samuel. I'm Samuel. Go. And I was like, I think that that's, you are that for so many of these people who are listening. So I just, Anthony, that, uh, I place myself at your and your community's service. Yeah. You tell me how I can serve you. And if, if I can, I will. Thank you so much, Chris. I'll, uh, for now, I'll just be uh, praying for you, and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. But I want to let you get back to the rest of your day, and I know that you're freezing in your <laughs> in your <laughs> office. So, <laughs> God bless you, brother. We'll be in touch. Yeah, God bless. Bye, Christopher. Peace.